five issues. Oh, okay. I'd like to call this meeting of the Jacksonville Planning Advisory Board to order. At this time, if you would please stand. Uh, Al Burgess is going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, and Al Keyes will lead us in invocation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, who is a God of order and justice, and is pleased when people have governed and are governed according to your will. I ask you, in the name of Jesus, to bless this city and its inhabitants. Bestow your guidance upon this committee and all who are in authority. Keep them mindful of the sacred trust and public office and grant them wisdom for their difficult tasks. Give them a sense of honesty and decency, a spirit of humility and service, and a sensitivity to the needs of every citizen. Give us all who live here in this city that we enjoy, be ready, and to be obedient to our laws. and be profoundly concerned for the rights and privileges of every citizen. Help us to be a light to the world and the salt of the earth in our city and a blessing to all our neighbors. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Well, thank everyone for coming out tonight. At this time, if you'll take a look at your agenda, um, the only thing we'd like to note on the agenda is that when we do nominations for uh, chairman and vice chairman, that they'll take effect at the next meeting. So we don't have to play musical chairs. Um, any additions, corrections, deletions, changes to the uh, agenda? If not, can we get a motion for approval? I make a motion to approve it. Motion by Ms. Vanderveer. Second. Second by Mr. Dorn. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please signify by raising your right hand. All those opposed, like. Motion passes. You've got the minutes in front of you. You have them mailed to you. I want to take just a brief moment to look back over them. If there are no changes, a motion to approve the minutes as presented would be in order. So moved. Motion by Mr. Keyes to approve the minutes, and second by Dr. Lasson. <laughs> Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please signify by raising your right hand. All those opposed, like. The motion passes. City Council update. Councilman Warden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a couple things. Uh, all uh, last last month, we uh, had to adjust some of the landscaping requirements for fire station number two. Uh, we originally. Uh, intended to do some plantings uh, underneath the power line and the power line company come back and said no we'd like to see something smaller and there was also some text amendments to our udo in regarding to signs um, you remember some of the items that we've uh, that we've changed uh, had to do with uh, some of the timing of the changing of the messages um, the ambient the lights uh, that uh, that they give out and so forth and so on. There were some heights that we changed and some other some other little minor tweaks to our sign ordinance. So again, we passed those based on y'all's recommendations. So. That's all I had, sir. And congratulations to uh, the only uh, man I know that's in two Hall of Fames, uh, Mr. Homer Spring. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> Very nice. Okay. Uh, inductee into the Onzo, Jacksonville Onzo uh, Sports Hall of Fame. I think that's uh, pretty impressive. And there's a, there's a picture. Yeah, Thank you yes. very much. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Old business, there being none. Let's go to new business. This is nominations for chairperson. I would like to make a nomination. Yes, ma'am. If accepted, I would like to nominate Dr. Lasson for chairman. We have a, I would like to say. Okay. Any other nominations? OK. 
Okay. I move we close on the said one name. Okay. There's a motion to mo close the nominations and select Dr. Lasan by acclamation. Mm -hmm. May we have a second? Second. Second. Mm -hmm. right. Mr. Keys. Okay. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by raising your right hand. Do I get to vote on this time? Do I get to vote this time? I think I should, shouldn't I? I am. Anyway, all those opposed? Okay, Dr. Lasagne, you're the chairman for next, next meeting. Next meeting. All right. Okay, now let's see. Oh. I'm not a stranger to it. Good. <clears throat> Vice chairman. They're looking. They're looking. I nominate Homer. Okay. And I'm assuming, can, can I serve? Okay. And I second. Second by Thomasine. Motion. Uh, close. Okay. Motion to close the nominations. Second. Second. Second by Ms. Vanderveer. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by raising your right hand. Good. I won't vote this time. Okay. okay. So. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. There Spring. You're. There you go. So we'll just we'll just switch gears. We won't have to move yeah. very far. Okay, <laughs> no, we now now we'll get to the real stuff. Um, rezoning. Who's oh up? Uh, agenda item B is a rezoning request at the corner of Piney Green and Hemlock. Drive, Piney Green Road and Hemlock Drive. Uh, the note, the correction, the address is not 131 Piney Green Road. That was uh, listed in error. Uh, we're just going to leave it without an address right now. It is the corner of Piney Green and Hemlock Road. Notice the location on the vicinity map before you. Closer, <clears throat> just to give you exactly which corner we're talking about. This is the subject par parcel in the area of photography for you. Wolf Properties LLC has submitted a rezoning request for the 0.71 acre tract of land located again at the corner of Piney Green Road and Hemlock Drive. The applicant is requesting the parcel, which is currently zoned neighborhood commercial, be rezoned to corridor commercial. Uh, this is the zoning map as it currently stands for you. Uh, notice the adjacent corridor commercial to the northwest and directly to the southwest of this property. And the properties across Piney Green are in Alza County's jurisdiction, but directly across the road is a church. And then to the northeast is a auto repair uh, company. This is the future land use map. And as you see, it is consistent with everything around it as a future land use identification of regional commercial. This would be the map, rezone, the zoning map if this rezoning is approved. <clears throat> if approved, the, uh, the rezoning would allow this use, to, this property to be used a little more broadly. Um, one specific use that comes to mind, the differences between neighborhood commercial and corridor commercial is multi-unit or shopping center buildings where you have two or three up to nine, ten units in a building. Um, that's one of the main differences that comes to mind when you have a corridor commercial zone property versus a neighborhood commercial. <clears throat> Staff is recommending approval of this request with findings of fact A through J being found in the affirmative and that this rezoning advances the public interest by creating more development opportunities and it is consistent with the future land use map. Mr. John Pierce of John L. Pierce and Associates is representing the client and is here along with staff to answer any questions you may have. Do we know what type of uh, uh, businesses they want to put in there? No, not, not specifically. The multi-unit building has been mentioned, but we do not have a development plan submitted for this property. <clears throat> I, I, I have one concern. And, um, uh, and you just asked a question. I'm leading into that. Being that we don't, being that we don't, we don't know what the intended use is. Mm -hmm. My concern is this location right here. You're going right into a curve. Okay. And it's kind of congested right now with the, uh, the, 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 um, the small units that they have right now. So um, if 
if if they don't know what is going with what the actual intent is, what's the point of changing the designation right now with all the construction going on? Uh, Mr. Pierce may be able to address that a little better than I, as representing his client. Um, again, it's a, from a, the staff standpoint, is looking at the future land use identification and following a trend that the city has in the general area of a um, rezoning to the corridor commercial, the property, the larger property to the north um, east was rezoned in the last few years, and there's a property. Um, just right here that was also recently zoned to corridor commercial. Um, but Mr. Pierce may be able to address um, specific development plans. John Pierce, 45 Johnson Boulevard. I'll, I would request that you find the funds you can pack to be confirmed. And to answer your question, I do know the plan use that I do know, of course, anytime you're rezoning, it would be basically contract zoning. If, but I do know he's planning on putting one of his, uh, his wife's in the tanning bed business, and he wants to put a multiple due to the land cost and the cost of construction. You can't put a multi-tenant use in a without getting his own CC. And if you look at the property to the rear of it, it's zone CC, so it fits the node, it fits the land use plan, but. The only thing I know for sure, he wants a rental build, a building there, plus his wife is, is wanting to put a uh, sun tanning bed there where you sun your buns and all that stuff in it. And I'd like to try to answer any other questions, but as far as the dress, I also met with the DOT, <coughs> and their plan is to have the road finished as of December 1, because it's already like six months over, a year over where it should have been completed. But my understanding of DOT is a roadway construction is scheduled to be finished December 1. So we got good access, and to be quite honest with you, uh, I don't think that, you know, you. It's, it's kind of an ideal location to do with it already meeting the land use and with all the surrounding properties on CC. Actually, the property to the rear of it is owned highway, uh, I mean, commercial corridor CC. I'm still getting used to these new zoning numbers and codes and names. It'll take a while. But I'd like to answer, I don't know if that addresses your concern, Mr. Burgess, but I'm just telling you all I know. And in order to cover now, due to the construction costs, you just about need a multi-tenant facility to accommodate. Just building an independent use, is just, the cost of development is just almost too high. Or too, it's so expensive, so you need a multi-tenant building. John. Yes, John, sir. John, the DOT is, do you think they probably will not let them have, there's not going to be a cut into Piney Green for oh, this. No, no sir, absolutely not. Hemlock. No, sir. No, sir, you're having it. And actually, at one point in time, Hemlock, and I made the, the purchaser aware of it, the, the builder, that it, it may be realigned to accommodate if that project's ever, if it's ever built across the road, there may be a realignment, but there is, there is an agreement to Hernandez had struck an agreement because one time across the road it was, um, the Walmart neighborhood market was looking good in there, but they, they, they're not good. They reneged on that due to construction costs, and they, they waited too late to meet the envelope to, to meet the Piney Green plan. They were too far along, so they're not building there. But something will develop there over time. And I, I would envision Hemlock Lane being rerouted at some point in time. Yeah, I, they line up with the project across the road. I do remember there was a time we were looking at Ham, Hamlock being rerouted whenever Patriot Park was uh, being proposed. Right. And, and that would have slid it further down, which this place still would have had access to Hamlock. It just would have been further back. That's the access we're going to have because there's a, there's a meeting there now, and our access is going to be at the back to get a full access, which would be better for traffic flow. We've done a little concept, and we plan on entering it at the back to alleviate the problem that you're addressing, Mr. Burgess, to make it a safe entry. Make sure you got proper sight distances. All clear over here, Mr. Pierce. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Yes, sir, you're welcome. Question. Yes, sir. Um, am I to understand that all of the surrounding properties on this side is already a uh, <clears throat> commercial corridor? Yeah. The yellow is not next door, but the yellow is residential, is. and we'll have to leave a buffer adjoining that. But I would envision as this develops, there'll be some 
rezoning request because at one time it was a, I represented a big development that was looking at, at purchasing that property and we would have been in if it went through we'd have been in for rezoning. And I know when you do build something there uh, you already already know about the restrictions and the limitation on parking and access yes, in sir. and out of there. Yes sir. And I would I would I would think an idea would be to, to assemble both pieces of property and development at one time. When I refer to that as a, the property to the rear, if you look at it, it really needs to be adjoined with this piece of property and developed simultaneously. Yeah. Is this kind of an odd shape? And it... It's kind of a remnant leftover piece. And the people next door, they've already been notified about this? The city notifies them. Yes, ma'am. We sent out courtesy notices prior to the planning board, but they'll receive the official public hearing notice prior to the planning board to the city council meeting in August. There's been nobody that has been against it. Not that I have heard a phone call or anyone into the office. I'd like to remind everybody that the motion should be uh, include uh, findings of fact A through J. Yes, Reggie. Yeah. Mr. Peters brought up contract zoning. Just want to um, state to y'all. You, I know you know this, but we have two types of rezoning, or general rezoning, which this is, which you have to consider every use which is allowed in court of commercial to see whether or not you want that property rezoned. But we also have the new conditional um, rezoning, where the owner can stipulate the uses that would be used there or prohibit some uses that won't go there. For example, if you know, if you felt a use a nightclub was not appropriate there, the owner could prohibit that use. So you have options. You don't have to just go with the general use. If you feel a conditional use request is more suitable for this site, then you can say that. You can't make him do it because the conditions have has to be done voluntarily, but you can put that on the record if you feel that way. Do you have to specify the conditions? You can give him recommendations on the conditions that you want to see. If you if you see some uses in court or commercial that you think don't fit there, you can tell him, well, you know, I, I may not vote on this request because I don't think this use is appropriate for that site. But he has to voluntarily put the conditions on the property. The owner does. That is correct. Consider. One thing you also need to keep in mind that we, we're required to leave a buffer adjoining the R7, RS7 property, and I think it's 30 foot buffer. So I don't, can't anticipate any obnoxious uses, no bigger piece of property than that is. Well, won't you need some buffer in between? That business and the and the uh, residential property. If it's if it's a button, the same type of zoning it would require one. Yeah, so the ordinance would require a thirty foot buffer along the yellow area. Right here, from there to there, they would have to have a buffer. But if that would be rezoned, required for the ordinance. That's correct. There's already something oh, there. Am I right? There's a house next door. Yes. Yeah, but well, when you look at the aerial map, isn't there like a um, what, what is is that? Area that I'm looking at is that a, a utility easement or a road or gravel drive that's on the adjoiner. Yeah, so the area in red would have to be um, meet our type A buffer requirements if the land is developed in a corridor commercial, should the rezoning be approved. Mm -hmm. Okay. See, and that's what I was thinking about when I earlier asked the question about parking and meeting all of the requirements of the dimensional requirements for parking and egress and so on. To have a site plan to meet all those requirements, parking requirements, <coughs> buffer requirements. There's property, there's already a sewer main that's been run across the front, so the utilities are available. And I understand it's like seven-tenths of an acre. Eight, I think it's point seven. Well, point seven six, isn't it? I got a map here. 
just a little under three quarters of an acre. And you couple that with the buffering and also the the setbacks, the lot configuration. It's going to reduce the amount of developable space. That's correct. About a half acre property? Almost three quarters. And that's that now. That's a yard. Right. And you're going to lose a lot with all the. Yeah, you're, you'll lose a lot. Yeah, you're, it would be an assumption, but I think that's probably a safe assumption that you'd lose a quarter. Yeah, you're, you're not going to see a big box store there. <laughs> Too small. Okay. I don't see any problems with that. Okay. Can we have a motion from someone, please? Okay. Here we go. Okay, I would move that we approve it based on the recommendations of the planning board, uh, approving the rezoning based on the findings, in fact, A through J, being found in the affirmative. Okay. The so rezoning advances the public interest by creating more development opportunities and making it consistent with future land use map. Okay. Okay. And we have a second? I'll second. It. Second from Suzanne. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion to approve the rezoning, please signify by raising your right hand. All those opposed, <clears throat> motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Pierce. Good to see you back again. You're up. Thank you, Chairman. Um, item C before you this evening is a unified development ordinance text amendment. This is a text amendment that staff has been working on over the past several months. We have done this in conjunction with um, working with the city attorney and also special legal counsel that we hired to assist us with this matter. The board may recall a few months ago we created some standards for reasonable accommodations. This is kind of a second part to that aspect. And basically the reasonable accommodations, since we haven't had a request uh, that's, well, it's a fairly new standard. Basically there's certain land uses that are afforded protections under the Federal Fair Housing Act. And an Oxford House is one of those. And because it's, uh, originally we basically looked at it as like a group home or family care home, which our ordinance already addressed. Through discussions with the Oxford Home folks and the legal counsel, special legal counsel that the city has contracted with, it was determined that we would be better suited to have specific ordinance language that deals with these Oxford houses. And on page 45 of the agenda packet, you can read that is one that is a self-run, self-supported recovery home for recovering alcoholics or drug addicts chartered by Oxford House Incorporated and governed by the bylaws of that corporation. And there goes on to further define an Oxford House. So within that, we determined that that's not exactly how our ordinance defines group homes or family care homes. So we came up with a new definition and Oxford Houses will be treated as such and we decided that we needed to have some standards similar to the family care group homes within our ordinance. So we discussed that with legal counsel and, and looked at the general statutes and the Federal Fair Housing Act, and we determined that we could limit them to a certain degree, but it would be fairly limited. Uh, and you can see those basic limitations that we're looking to have added to the ordinance on page 44. For example, uh, if adopted, the Oxford homes would have to stay separated from other Oxford homes by 1,000 feet, as well as away from other family care homes and group homes by 1,000 feet. That's so that we don't end up with a concentration of these um, Oxford homes you know, right there together on top of one another, even though they're defined as a single family dwelling in accordance with the Federal Fair Housing Act. The Oxford House folks have told us that you know, having a 1,000 foot separation would be something that that they could achieve 
here in Jacksonville, and it's similar to what other people have done as well. So we've added a few other adjustments um, and proposed amendments that uh, you can find there on page 44. And we also felt that we needed to revise the accessory use standards and the accessory use table that you can see at the bottom of 44 and on page 45. And we moved those over to the standard use table in 4.11. You can see that they're identified with the underlining. Um, basically, family care homes are gonna be treated the same but different than group homes, same but different than Oxford houses. So everywhere that uh, single family homes are permitted, an Oxford house would be permitted. They just would have to meet the spacing criteria. So based on the information that we've gotten from special legal counsel and the city attorney, this is the code that we have put forth recommending approval, recommending, asking the planning board to provide a recommendation, uh, recommending approval of this text amendment. And this will go before city council, I believe at their second meeting in August, which is the 16th. Be happy to try to answer questions. I know this is kind of a non-typical um, agenda item in terms of the request. It's kind of a special specialty use request. Do we have any of those homes now? <clears throat> no. To our knowledge, there's two in Jacksonville. I, I have a, I have an issue that, that I want to bring up. Um, it's, it's, it's long been known, um, not just in, in Onslow County, but other counties that we have problems with recidivism. And um, if you go to somewhere like New Hanover County, um, particularly on um, Prince's Place, I don't know if anybody has been in the area before, but they have halfway houses over there. So the way this is written, I mean, um, how would that affect um, uh, the city's ability to um, uh, establish uh, prison reentry programs um, whereby uh, they could have halfway houses in, in certain areas? That's like a concern of mine because you have here, it says an Oxford house, well, what you have would be Oxford, Oxford house homes or similar homes. So uh, what you have, as far as the definition is concerned, you have an Oxford, an, an Oxford house model shall not include persons being, I'm assuming that's supposed to be housed, housed in a correctional facility or mentally ill person who, is, who are dangerous to others as defined by General Statute 122, TAC 311B as amended. So what is the difference? Okay, so the, um, uh, you're looking to strike the definition above and add this one, correct? No, sir. We are looking to add the definition of Oxford House for similar homes. So underlining on the bottom of page 45, we would propose that that be added to our ordinance. The information above that that you see with the strike throughs is removing it from Article 4.3 accessory use standards. So that would be removed from that section and it would be relocated under 4.1 and 4.2, which is the use table and the use specific standard section of the ordinance. <coughs> Halfway houses are defined at per our ordinance, I'm pretty sure, and there are specific locations in which halfway houses can go and they are defi defined separately. This is specific to Oxford House, which is a home for recovering addicts as defined here in the ordinance and protected under the Federal Fair Housing Act. Well, you threw some specificity in there in respects to what um, uh, Oxford House model shall not include. So if you, if you um, well, if the, uh, the staff felt the need to include some specificity there in respects to what it shall not include, it's my assumption that there must be some um, um, ambiguity in respects to what the definition of a halfway house is right now as far as the, um, uh, what you currently have in place. What's, you, you have a definition now of halfway house? <coughs> Are we, can you get the ordinance, Spine Chair, do you have it pulled up? Can you grab a copy? It should be on my desk. Uh, basically, we deal with ambiguity a lot of times, and I can tell you that when you make it clear, it, you eliminate that ambiguity. And it's, there's no way that an Oxford house could be confused with a home for those that are, for those that are basically leaving a correctional facility or mentally ill. There's other, there's other uses that are defined in the code that deal with 
those type individuals. Understood. But my, 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 my point is, is that if, if, if the staff believed that was the case, I don't believe that they would have felt that it would have, um, uh, it would nece necessitate more specificity in respects to what um, uh, um, an Oxford home is and what a halfway house is. Permission written by. Council. I believe it was. outside council. We, we have a special legal counsel that, that, that specializes in these type cases, and he wrote this definition. A lot of times, attorneys want to make sure that there are no errors and things, so sometimes we overwrite. So they just want to make sure that you know that it's not to be included or confused with any correctional facility. That may not be needed, but a lot of times attorneys put things in like that. Understood. I just, my thing is, I, I just, I, I just would hate to have some language that would, um, quote unquote, cause a common community issue to be marginalized. You know, I mean, that's my thing. And I'm, I'm just concerned about the fact that you've included somebody that's leaving the prison system and they might be an alcoholic. Why can't they stay in this house, I, Oxford House? As long as, they, as long as they have their full release, they're not released um, under a halfway house. This says that an Oxford House model should not include persons being housed in a correctional facility. It should be housed. Okay. So if that person has their full relief, release from the criminal justice system and they're alcoholic or drug drug addict, they should be able to reside in the Oxford House. And how do we define who's mentally ill and dangerous because we have a lot of mentally ill Yeah, you see that? The, 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 the state defines it, general statutes defines it, and like we go by that, like by that definition. So we have halfway houses are a special use in the quarter commercial zone and they're permitted in the industrial zone. And a halfway house is defined in the Unified Development Ordinance as a licensed home for juveniles or adult persons on release from more restrictive custodial confinement or initially placed in lieu of such more restrictive custodial confinement, wherein supervision, rehabilitation, and counseling is provided to assist residents back into society, enabling them to live independently. So we've got kind of a tiered system. Halfway houses are already addressed. There's certain zones, certain standards. We have things for group homes and family care homes. This is adding a specific Oxford home category and specific standards, especially given the fact that they are protected under the Federal Fair Housing Act. For lawsuit reasons, it was advised that we create language in our ordinance to deal with these situations specifically, as our ordinance currently does not have any things anything for them. So we already have these. This is just putting everything on paper. Just because we have two doesn't mean that they went through it the way that we would like to see them go in the future. Oxford House contention is they are protected under the Federal Fair Housing Act and they are basically no different than any other single family home in Jacksonville, even though there's eight unrelated people that live there. So our definition of a single family doesn't allow an Oxford house to go there. Right. But they're protected under the Federal Fair Housing Act, as I understand it. Therefore, they're allowed to go there. This is just going to create specific provisions for them to utilize moving forward. Have we had any problems with the ones that we have already? I am not aware of any problems for the two that we have in Jacksonville, but I mean, it's, it's one of those things to where, I mean, I'm not going to say that there's not been any issues. I'm just not aware of any. Ryan, question, question it. Um, um, just um, tagging on to, to what was just asked. What specific issue is the staff trying to mitigate if there hasn't been any issues? Conflict with our ordinance. Right now, our ordinance defines family as... Mm -hmm. UDO defines a family, let's see here, an individual or two or more persons related by blood, marriage, or adoption living together as a single housekeeping unit 
or a group of not more than three persons not related by blood, marriage, or adoption living together as a single housekeeping unit as in a family care home. So if there's more than three people not related by blood or marriage, then they're in violation of our zoning ordinance. Oxford House has stated they want seven or eight people not related by blood or marriage in a single home. By our reading of the ordinance, they were in violation or would be in violation of the code. However, from discussing with legal counsel, they are afforded protections that others may not be under the Federal Fair Housing Act. And therefore, that's why we're adding language. So one more question. So basically, um, it, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to assume that um, this definition um, um, uh, it's been, I'm not going to say you put it in it because, because of what you're speculating, but I know there was a situation before when they requested the special use permit, correct? It was a, when, when didn't somebody request a special permit? Yeah. Uh, yeah, they did go to the, the Board of Adjustment for the permit. That case is on hold um, pending this text change. Um, so that if text change goes, goes through, mm -hmm. council approves the text change, that Board of Adjustment uh, request will probably be pulled, pulled by the um, Oxford House. Okay, so how would how would what we um, do here today affect that? Would it have any any effect on that? It would. Yes. It would. Well, well, you're a recommending body, so you you could recommend approval or denial to council. <laughs> council has the final action, so what council ultimately does will will affect what what steps the Oxford House takes in the future. Yeah. So basically, that Oxford House that you're referring to went in did not obtain permits. From the city's reading of the code, we basically sent a violation notice that said, you're in violation of the code de definition of single family. They said, oh, not so fast. We are exempt. We are protected by the Federal Fair Housing Act. They took and made a request to the Board of Adjustment. Before we had the meeting on the Board of Adjustment, we basically said, time out. We need to have a discussion to make sure that we are on good, solid legal grounds. Based on the discussions that we've had with the Oxford House, special legal counsel for the city, and the city attorney, we now bring forth an ordinance that will deal with this issue that the current ordinance does not adequately address. So as it relates to that location, they're going to be the first one. So as long as they can meet the thousand foot spacing and the other provisions of this ordinance, they will then make application accordingly to basically lock themselves in to that location. And like Reggie said, they'll then withdraw the request that they had had made to the Board of Adjustment. Okay. And we believe potential litigation will also go away. Very good. Thank you, Ryan. I have three questions of clarification. I think it's already been, been explained. As I understand it, they will not be permitted to have, knowingly have mentally ill people in there. Yes. Knowingly. Right. Second thing, they won't won't require any signage, and the third thing is that they will be permitted to be uh, within a residential community. Correct. Mm -hmm. Because they're an Oxford house. Protected under the federal yes. fair housing as and, a single family and, dwelling. And, right. and the statement in there that talks about an Oxford house model shall not include was put in there so that other groups couldn't say, well, we're just like an Oxford house. We won't fall under those guidelines. Correct. And this was done so that they couldn't crawl in under that <coughs> umbrella of, quote, the Oxford house model. That's right. What does That's it take point. for them to be an Oxford house? I mean, do they uh, have to apply for that name, or can they just, as long as they uh, abide by the rules of an Oxford house, claim to be one without applying for the name. They would want to apply for a zoning permit to lock themselves in so that another Oxford house couldn't come in within a thousand feet of that location. So there's some benefits to them locking in so that they're protected. Because if they just open and we don't have any way of knowing it and somebody else comes in behind them and they get permitted, then they won't be afforded the protection by the city zoning that the other Oxford House would. But they don't have to get this, like, from the government, they don't have to get this name Oxford House? I mean, they just have to do it through the city? Oh, the Oxford House program, I mean, that's that's a designation, that's a state program, or I guess it's not really a state National. program. It's There's a separate program for that. 
We say Oxford House are similar because there may be another model that comes in that basically has a self-governed household unit that's protected under the Federal Fair Housing, and therefore we would look at them like we do the Oxford House. Is it like licensed through the government, the federal government, or is that? Because mm -hmm. when they come to, do they have any papers to show that they are Oxford House, or just as long as they comply with the rules of it, you accept it? I think that's a question that we'll have to get additional clarification from legal counsel on what's the process going to be. Well, the definition says that they uh, that they have a charter from Oxford House Incorporated. Mm -hmm. So they'll have to, in order to get that charter, they have to meet certain requirements. So that group that has to get that yeah. before they come in. That's what I was kind of getting at, yeah. But, but it also says or similar models. Right, so which we'll means... we'll have to deal with but, the and, specifics. And again, that's probably why they, they also put that about what the Oxford House model shall not include. <laughs> so that a group that does include, uh, that, that isn't the Oxford House model as we see it now, couldn't come in and say, well, we're a, an other... Cambridge model house, you know, for lack of anything better. Mm -hmm. Good discussion. Yeah. <clears throat> Is this enough to make the recommendation, or do you have to go more than that? Uh, yeah, just to prove the text of that. I, I got another. I got another question, and it, it, it would um, make me a little more comfortable. Uh, I don't have that statute in front of me. By any chance, do you have um, that specific statute printed out? Since you're referring to it, it's. Um, uh, defining a uh, mentally ill person because the Oxford House, you know, <coughs> it, it's, it's supposed to help those recovering from mental illness and alcoholism and, and drug addiction. So, if that's the purpose of the, of the Oxford House, I just want to make sure that <coughs> that whatever we're um what, whatever we agree to right here is consistent with the Oxford House model, because if it's not consistent and you already have a hearing going on right now uh, um, uh, based upon ambiguity, I, I wouldn't want to do anything that would um, uh, not be consistent with what's established in respects to that Oxford House model. So do you have that that statute that you put in there? Well, with this, didn't you use, like, have you said you had a special attorney, a law firm that handled this? Aren't Do, do they typically work with the Oxford House so they're aware of What's allowed and not allowed? This attorney so they, is it's representing, representing them, right? They've represented other cities. We've With got this. somebody that's represented other cities as it relates to Oxford House. They have their own attorney that's been with the Oxford House for 20 years or, or more. But I'm saying this attorney or law firm they're aware and they're familiar with us, so they know yeah. the correct verbiage. Yeah, very familiar with it. That's, that's why um, I see the attorney um, consulted with this attorney because he specializes in this type of law. Um, but then, Mr. Burgess, you mentioned Oxford House. You, meant, you mentioned mentally ill, and by definition, mentally ill is not associated with the Oxford I House. I said recovering. Okay. Recovering. Okay. Recovering alcohol is a drug addiction. <clears throat> addicts, but yeah. you mentioned re mental, re mental re ill, too, but re that's not part of the Oxford House. No, I, I, got that, I got that piece on my phone okay. from, from what I had looked up But um, in respects to the Oxford House. But I just need to know um, if... if um, if you're um, making reference to a, a general statute, that, sp that specific um, uh, provision, I just would like to know what that is so I can be more comfortable about what I'm voting on or not going to vote on. Or it could be amended. After I read this before, you know, I'm assuming that I'm pulling this from the NC um, webpage, but 11B. Define, it starts with, and I quote, dangerous to others, and means that within the relevant past, the individual has inflicted or attempted to inflict or threatened to inflict serious body harm on another or has acted in such a way as to create a substantial risk of serious bodily harm to another or who has engaged in extreme destruction of property and that there is reasonable probability that this conduct will be repeated. Previous episodes of dangerousness to others when applicable may be considered when determining reasonable probability of future dangerous conduct. Clear, cogent, and convincing evidence that an individual has committed a homicide in the relevant past is prima facie evidence of dangerous to others. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm good to go. Okay. Good. 
I would like to make a <coughs> recommendation that we approve the zoning text amendment found in attachment A. Okay, we have a motion from Ms. Vanderbeek. Do we have a second? Second. Second, second from Dr. Lassan. <laughs> he was <closer>. Sorry. <laughs> Any other discussion? Very good. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by raising your right hand. All those opposed? Okay, the motion passes. Okay, it's time for reports. <clears throat> Stand in here. I'll just report from here. Um, I would like to publicly thank Colonel Grover Lewis for his service on the planning board. Mr. Lewis has unfortunately had to resign his position on both the Community Development Advisory Committee and in turn his position here on the Planning Advisory Board. The reason being he We've lost him in one sense, but we've gained him in another. He actually took a position with the city of Jacksonville, so we're glad to have him as a teammate here with the city of Jacksonville. But because of the conflicts that could be perceived and based on the rules for the boards and commissions, he is unable to serve on a uh, advisory committee um, role. So we're going to hate to see him go from the board aspect, but we're glad to have him be part of the team. So that's why he's not here tonight, and I uh, talked to him um, this more, um, earlier today and um, wish him well in his, his new endeavor and uh, told him that uh, should he decide to move past his current position with the city to definitely consider to put his name back in the hat to uh, come back on as an advisory committee member. So sad to see him glow, but at the same time happy. Um, one other thing that um, many folks, the board, people that may be watching this on G10 tonight or on replays, the last Thursday, the preliminary draft flood maps were released by um, the State Department of Public Safety in conjunction with FEMA, and it's going to impact Jacksonville uh, if the draft maps get adopted as they are pretty substantially. We've gone from, I think it's 500 and some structures, not lots, structures, um, going from the special flood hazard area to 1,369 so that means that there's about 800 and some that uh, if they have a federally backed mortgage will have to obtain flood insurance potentially and depending on where the finished floor elevation of the house or structure is um, could play a huge role or would play a huge role in their insurance premiums there's also some additional undeveloped lots that are also impacted by the draft flood maps so i would recommend that everybody um, even in some areas that you wouldn't think, um, you'd think that they wouldn't flood, you need to get online, uh, come down to City Hall and talk with, with one of the staff members here with Planning and Permitting or myself. Look at it online. And a website that you can look at is fris.nc.gov. Once again, that's fris.nc.gov. That's basically the North Carolina Flood Risk Information page. It's a GIS program. So if you're used to using a GIS program, it'll come second nature to you. But basically, it's going to be the state, uh, the United States, I believe you'll click on. By going to the frizz.nc, you'll go straight to North Carolina. Uh, yes. NC. F-R. F. I'm, I'm sorry. F-R-I-S. Frizz. Frizz. Dot N-C. Dot go. Okay. So basically, it's going to take you to North Carolina. You click on Onslow County. You can search by address, although last week the search tool was not working. Um, so you can zoom into your area. In the upper right-hand corner, you've got a box that says effective. That's the current maps. You're going to do the drop-down arrow and go to preliminary, and you can see what's being proposed. So in some cases, elevations are going from uh, 4 feet to 10, and the city of Jackson has a 3-foot uh, freeboard requirement on top of that with our flood prevention ordinance. So as you can imagine, on Court Street, homes are right now probably at about elevation six. That moving forward, if that house were demolished and rebuilt, that house, if it's basically the finished floor is currently at six, go to 13 with the finished floor elevation. So that's seven feet higher on Court Street. That's pretty substantial. Um, City Council back a few months ago authorized the staff to uh, contract with a company 
an international company, and the, their office is out of Charleston, South Carolina, but they also have offices in uh, Melbourne, Florida, Dubai. Like I said, it's an international company. They are in the process of analyzing the data that the State Department has um, provided, and we're actually obtaining additional information. That it's, it's four terabytes of data. It's going to take them two days to download it to our external hard drive, which we're in the process of having done. And it basically boils down to right off the bat, 2.1 feet has been added for storm surge. And the new modeling, um, they use six storm tracks. Uh, they ran 675 synthetic storm runs based on that information. And as a result, basically they're saying, hey, you know, the water's going to be higher than what the old flood maps identify. So we are tentatively looking to have them present their initial findings for phase one to city council on Wednesday, August the 3rd. That's the night after National Night Out. Um, that'll be the first meeting that city council has after they've, they're taking July off after all the extra time they spent in the recently adopted budget process that they just went through. And so you'll definitely want to pay attention to that and see kind of what, what our consultant is stating. And based on that information, uh, the city will have, city council will have a decision to make on whether they believe based on the information that the consultant has observed and, and the data provided by the state, if it's something that the city wants to look to make an official appeal to the state FEMA folks to basically kind of dispute the data. And um, that's something that city council will have to consider. And regardless, um, the new maps, whether they're amended or whether we appeal, basically they don't believe the maps will go into effect until about March of 2018. So there's a lot of time between now and then, but you don't need to wait till March of 18. There's certain things like obtaining flood insurance before those things go into effect um, that basically could, could definitely help out. Um, we, are, we have been talking with other municipalities, um, Moorhead City, Carteret <coughs> County, if you look at the presentation that they showed, and we'll look to provide that to, to the planning board if you're interested as well. Basically, from Cape Lookout to the south, the numbers went up pretty substantially. So our area has been impacted pretty pretty hard. Moorhead City, New Bern, Craven County, um, Onslow <coughs> County, it's, it's changing quite substantially. So we're looking to see if there's anything uh, within those models, those engineers, those technical gurus that that are with uh, ATM, the company that we've hired, to look to see if there's anything that may be able to be basically have the model rerun that shows something differently. So be happy to answer any questions that any of you or the citizens may have. Obviously, now is probably not the best time, but where I can get in front of a computer and say how your property is or is not proposed to be impacted by that and um, provide guidance as it relates to that program. <coughs> Other than that, that's uh, all that I have tonight. And congratulations, um, outgoing Chairman Spring, on your induction into the Anza County Hall of Fame, Sports Hall of Fame. Good, <coughs> my congratulations to you too, Mr. Spring. Thank you. And I want to express my um, thank you to Colonel Lewis for you know, um, all he's done for Jacksonville. He's going to be missed on two boards. And third, um, I want to congratulate y'all on tonight. I think we had some healthy <laughs> debate or questions on both issues. I think as staff, I think we appreciate uh, when you have questions. Um, it, it keeps us sharp. I think we, you know, when we submit these reports to you, we want to stand behind them. So any questions you have, feel free to ask them. And I, 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 I'm pretty sure my staff enjoys the questions. I know I do. So um, keep them coming. To that uh, thank you for your preparation tonight and for your uh, participation. Mm -hmm. um, any other business? If not, we'll hear a motion to adjourn. It's, it's been fun. Make a motion to adjourn. adjourn. Second. 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 We're out of here. Motion's adjourned. <laughs>